House of Dudley, um, A New History of Tudor England, is her acclaimed first book. Um, and it's described by the Times as, and I quote here, exciting and immersive, an immensely entertaining history, capturing in full Tudor brilliance the cutthroat glamour of the English throne and the most audacious family to play its game. And chairing this event with Joe is Dr. Vanda Vaporska. Vanda is the chief executive of the Society of Genealogists, the national charity that houses the largest archive and library on family history. She previously led the Equality Trust. She's a visiting research fellow at the University of York and a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Um, she's a historian of the early modern period and her first book, Witchcraft in Early Modern Poland, 1500 to 1800, was shortlisted for the Catherine Briggs Folklore Award and recognized as, and I quote here, a substantial contribution to the study of Central, Eastern, Central and Eastern European witchcraft, which offers her readers a rich and engrossing survey of Polish witchcraft, end quote. She regularly contributes to a range of historical events, podcasts and interviews, and she was the Starren Senior Scholar at Hartford College Oxford and has lectured at a number of universities and is also a regular face at HistFest as well. So Vanda, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I absolutely love HistFest. I mean it's everything I would have wanted to have seen when I was much younger and, and to get involved with so it's an absolute honour and I just want to really pay tribute to Rebecca for starting it all off, continuing it and having that vision. So she's the reason we're all here which is fantastic so HistFest gets my vote every time. I, I basically just nag her and say are you doing another one? Are you doing another one? Can we have some more please? <laughs> so fantastic. Um, I'm really really honoured to be here with Joanne um, and I will share a little snippet of what happened in the green room because I just have to. <laughs> so, <laughs> Joanne's name is Paul. My grandmother's name was Paul. And when I told my mum I was doing this session, she said, oh, do you think you're related? Laugh jokingly. It turns out that her ancestors were in Plymouth. My great, gr my grandmother came from Plymouth. And we're going to have a much longer conversation about yeah. this <laughs> over email for the next couple of years, probably. So um, possibly related. Yeah. You heard it first <laughs> here at HistFest. Um, but it just goes to prove how important family trees, genealogy, the things that we do in history, just automatically looking at those relationships are. And that's why I'd like to start by asking you to really sort of untangle this web of, of Dudleys, of Greys, of Guildfords, because we all know a little bit about one or two of them, but how they all interact together, I think is really fascinating. So just to sort of set that scene. Yeah, I can do my best. I mean, I, I was just saying I should have put up some family trees or something, which of course um, made Vanda very excited because I said the word <laughs> family tree. Um, but uh, I, I think that's one of the things that we have to really um, appreciate going into the 16th century is how entangled all of these families are. And I think it's very, very difficult to fully understand and appreciate that without A, doing these family trees and realizing that actually they're all interconnected, um, but also spending time with the story. And so that was one of the things I found in doing the House of Dudley is that these connections between the families um, were not only multi-layered, um, were not only, um, f I mean, pivotal to the individuals, um, but really important to the families as well. And um, they created these networks, um, and I think we're really fully appreciating in the early modern period how important these networks were to people um, that really influenced um, the major events of Tudor history. Um, so to try a little bit, um, the Dudleys, of course, are the family that I'm particularly interested in in this book. Um, but they intermarry um, with the greys at various points. Um, you will probably have heard of at least one grey, and that's Lady Jane Grey, of course. The Dudleys were related to her a few times over, um, and we'll probably talk a little bit about um, the, the Jane Grey episode as well. Hugely important family. And then you also mentioned the Guilfords. Um, the Guilfords um, maybe have have less sort of familiarity with people, um, but Mother Guilford was uh, a figure who went over with Mary Tudor when she married into France and um, was a sort of mother figure to, to Mary Tudor, another important um, Tudor family. And Jane Guilford becomes Jane Dudley, Duchess of Northumberland, who is one of really, I think, my favorite figures in this book and, and perhaps one of the most pivotal. And I think that's one of the things to just, um, I haven't disentangled them, but, <laughs> um, but just, just to, to sort of finish up on, on that point is 
Um, I think that's one of the things I learned as well in writing The House of Dudley was this relationship between um, women's natal families and, and the families that they marry into um, and the way in which sometimes it's the case that you know, Jane really becomes a Dudley and she is fighting for the Dudleys and, and uh, she really is part of the House of Dudley and, and saves the House of Dudley, I, I would suggest it, at um, one of the, the crucial moments um, in, in their story and, and in this book. Um, but others, somebody like uh, Mary Sidney, for instance, who's born a Dudley, she stays a Dudley. <laughs> um, and her, her son, Philip Sidney, um, goes on to um, declare that he is a Dudley. Um, and his father, even, Henry Sidney, who just marries a Dudley, um, instructs him on how important it is that he, he knows his mother's family and he, he protects his mother's family. Um, so it, it doesn't always become the case that, well, you marry into a family and, and that's, that's your family now. Someone like Mary Sidney, she stays a Dudley and, and her, her children are Dudleys as well. And it's, it's really interesting that you talk about that recognition of the matrilineal line because yeah. very often we find in family trees that women are just not you know, not mentioned or you yeah. just get a first name and it's yeah. really, really difficult to then to then trace. So yeah. it, it's, I suppose it's making that calculated decision of which is the family with the most power and what at that point is, is gonna benefit you. Yeah, I think it's it's a lot, you know, always follow the power um, with, in Tudor politics, which is really actually follow the proximity to the monarch. Um, and that's probably exactly what's going on. But I think there's something we do too when we study history. For instance, we know her as Lady Jane Grey. By then she was Lady Jane Dudley and was associated with the Dudley family and is referred to in the, in the, the texts of the time, in the records, as Jane Dudley, as we'd expect her to be. But we think about her as Jane Grey and I think that does something to our understanding of the past when we start playing with those last names or of course, removing them all together because we remove people from those networks, which as I said, are, are so important to what's happening. Mm. So I'm gonna take you back to the sort of, well, the start of the importance of the Dudleys. So Edmund Dudley, someone that I had glancingly come across, yeah. but is absolutely fascinating. I mean, he's really quite horrible, isn't he? Tell us a bit more about <laughs> I'm, I'm making it completely subjective. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. It's been so, it's been so interesting because, you know, I, I spent five years writing this book and, you know, spent five years with these people, essentially, <laughs> and sort of forms, tried not to form too many of my own opinions because you, you don't want to do that when you're writing a history book. But obviously, you can't help it at the same time and, and have, have my own feelings towards each of them. And it's so interesting now letting it out there. And, and I'm literally getting emails from people going, oh my God, I hate Edmund Dudley. <laughs> what he does to Sunif is just horrible. And you know, and I'm getting these messages and it's, it's just, I find it really, really fascinating people's sort of visceral emotional reactions to these people. So um, Edmund Dudley, um, probably people may have heard him as Epsom and Dudley, that sort of pairing. Of, of ministers under Henry VII. Um, but again, people often don't associate him with the later Dudleys, mm -hmm. which of course it's, it's, it's just three generations we're talking about um, across the Tudor period. Uh, he was the elder son of a younger son of a baron. Um, so sort of upper middling in terms of, of, of Tudor society would have been very unimportant um, if not for um, he uh, goes, studies the law, um, sort of niche subjects in the law, the king's prerogative, ancient laws of the king's prerogative, should have never been important, except um, at exactly that, that time, Henry VII um, has just lost his eldest son, he's lost his wife, he's starting to become that Henry VII that we might think of, that, that miser, mm -hmm. um, collecting his coin, and um, a number of his close ministers have, have just died. And, and one of them in particular um, seems to suggest, I have just the man for you, um, who, who knows all the laws, who are, are, are gonna fix this for you and, and make sure that you can shore up enough wealth to ensure that, that your son, little Prince Henry, um, has, has a secure reign. And so introduces Henry VII um, to Edmund Dudley. And in within months, um, he's uh, meeting with the king regularly. He started an account book for the king. And in the sort of three and a bit years um, that uh, we have his account book for, 
raises phenomenal amounts of coin um, for, uh, for the crown. Um, I think it's in the tens of millions in today's money. Um, it is, he, he just squeezes <laughs> everyone he can for coin, as you say, in really unpleasant to read ways. Um, in terms of who he is as a, as a character, I mean, again, I'll, I'll leave it to, to others to, to judge. I'm interested in what other people think. I read him as someone who's um, incredibly, almost has this sort of black and white perspective on things. If the king wills it, then that is, is it, <laughs> right? Questions stop at that point. If the king wills something to be so, it must be so. And so if the king wills that um, you have to give him 500 pounds, I mean, that's, that's just it. And it doesn't matter how fair that is. It doesn't matter if that will bankrupt you. It doesn't matter that you don't deserve it or any, any of those things. It's just that's the king's will. And he's very, very interested in executing the king's will. Um, he, at the same time, he seems to have a very happy, healthy family life. Um, and so it's, it's interesting, these sort of two parts, are the, the public reputation and what I try to get into a bit in this book, which is, which is the private life and who they really are. Um, trying to square those things, well, I think that's, that's, that's the difficulty and the humanity of history, really, is, is that it isn't good guys and, and bad guys. It's very, very complex individuals. It's interesting, isn't it? Because that is, you know, that is the will of the law, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not my law. It's not my fault the law oh, is that. Yeah. This is what the law says. Yeah, and he, he, you know, when he is, so he does end up, spoilers, um, he ends up in the tower, um, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's going to be executed for, for treason um, and he's, he panics and, and he's getting these letters saying, you know, you took 20 pounds from me, you, you took 500 pounds from me, give it back. Um, and he's very, he, he has this very emotional response of, it, it wasn't me. I, I really think I, it, it was unjust what happened to you, but the king wanted it to happen. Um, and he, he also starts to, to panic. He plans an escape from the tower. Which, when I found that, um, it's, in, it's in a copy of his will. Mm. He puts it in there that, yeah, I, I, I did want to escape. Um, he plans this escape from the tower, and he's obviously very, very panicked by his fate. And, and you can see that sort of black and white perspective on the world sort of breaking mm. under the pressure of that moment. It's, it's so fascinating. And I think what's interesting there, when he's confronted by his own mortality, mm. he knows he's, you know, he's about to get, about to meet his maker and have that final reckoning, yeah. that he makes a list of all of those wrongs, yeah. doesn't he? Which is yeah. just fascinating. Yeah, he writes out all of the people who were hard done by um, under, under his watch um, and in what way they were hard, hard done by um, and how much, how much they're owed um, because I think he's trying to settle settle accounts, as it were, both, both in the sort of real sense and because and, uh, he knows he's about to meet his maker um, mm -hmm. and, and it's going to all come due. Um, and I mean, as a historian, it's a fantastic record, um, but you, you also have to look at a, an article like that and go, what, what was motivating that person, you know, essentially facing their death to, to write out that list of people they had wronged? Mm -hmm. And as you say, I mean, the moment you find something like that in an archive, it's just thrilling, isn't it? It's, you know, it's, really... it's thrilling and, and chilling mm -hmm. almost at, at the same time. Um, there's, there's something, too, about, and, you know, this was something I missed um, in, in, in lockdown when I was finishing the book, is there's something about interacting with those documents um, when, when they're not copies, when, when um, they're, they're, they're originals and they're, they're genuine. Um, because there's something about pen hitting paper that is a moment in time that is, that is sort of captured and lost all at once. And to be able to interact with that moment in time and the only emotion um, and the context that, that goes into it is, whew, yeah, it, it, is, it is something um, that is very difficult to describe, but I think it's important that we're aware of, of that feeling that it invokes. And, you know, I try to express a bit of that in the writing of The House of Dudley. And I think one of the things that struck me about the book was just the sort of incredible depth of detail 
about a whole range of different aspects of Tudor life. So, so was almost incidentally, you, you find out information about you know, the wardrobe or the stables or all these sorts of things. And it's done in a very sort of casual way. It's not overburdening the learning in a sense. You, know, you don't sort of get the sense that, oh, I must write a little bit about this. So it really, really flows, which makes it so nice to read. And, and coming back to, so you've talked about Edmund's demise. Mm. Of course, his son was very aware of that and then went on to, was very aware of the fact that Henry had ordered his father's death, as, mm -hmm. as with so many people in the Tudor period, obviously, you know, most of them had to get over the fact Edmund that... Edmund was one of the first. <laughs> it, has to, it has to be said. He was one of the OG traitors, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you have to get over the fact that the king you're serving just happened to kill your father or yeah. your brother or your mother and whatever. It was yeah. just one of those things, wasn't it, at that court? So how, do, how did John... How did John's rise occur and what were the pitfalls for him coming yeah. to the next generation? So John was, was very young, um, six or seven, when his father was executed um, and immediately uh, becomes a ward of the crown. Um, his mother remarries, and this is the first woman to really save the House of Dudley. Uh, his mother remarries um, the illegitimate uncle of the king, Arthur Plantagenet. Um, so right in there, um, around the circle of this brand new king, which I think does very well for, for young John. Uh, he's placed in the household of the Guilfords. Um, so there's our first connection with the Guilfords um, and is raised as a ward, which is essentially like a, an adopted son, really. Um, and the Guilfords oversee his education. They're well connected. Um, he is forgiven because um, he, of course, would carry his father's sin, that stain of, of the attainder of treason follows the bloodline until um, he is restored in blood. And, but he is restored, um, so he's able to inherit property, he's able to hold position, um, he's, he's able to rise in, in the court. Um, and he does so in the way that, that most um, young courtiers rise in the court of Henry VIII, um, a combination of the battlefield and uh, the joust, the tournament. Um, he's, he's chivalrous, um, he's uh, quite good at, at martial arts, um, he manages to go to war in France and survive it, he comes back, he makes friends with Charles Brandon, um, close friend of, of the king, um, and through all of that um, he's, he's able to find a certain standing. What I found interesting in writing this book is I sort of expected that I would have nothing to write about through a fair bit of Henry VIII's reign. Because I thought, okay, well, you know, when we get to Edmund Dudley, that's, you know, quite a good story. He ends up on the block. We can do a bit around young John, all right, sure. And then, you know, the Dudleys don't get up to much, do they, until, you know, <laughs> Edward VI, really. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> Not so. He, they, they just kept popping up. And it, I, it, I just, it was so fascinating, especially under each of the queens. There was always a connection with one of the queens. Um, and it was either John or it was Jane. He, by that point, married Jane Guilford, the, um, the, the daughter of, of um, the Guilford who took him in. Um, and, and theirs is a wonderful story. They'd, they'd known each other as children, mm -hmm. and um, they have 13 children of their own, so I think they liked each other. <laughs> um, uh, and so they're this real team. In, in the Tudor court. Um, so they do quite well under Anne Boleyn because by then um, they're, they're leaning towards the sort of evangelical religion and um, so, so forms some connections under Anne Boleyn. Um, she, Jane becomes a lady under Jane Seymour and so is connected with Jane Seymour. Um, they both hold offices uh, under Anne of Cleves. Um, the Howards hate the Dudleys, just a thing to know. Um, so they don't do so well under Catherine Howard, but that's okay, because that's over in about five minutes anyway. Um, <laughs> and he actually ends up carrying notes of her confession to the king, um, so does quite well out of that. And then Jane Dudley is a very good friend of, of Catherine Parr. So through each of them, they just keep rising, and they keep, they keep, they keep surviving, really, um, through this period of, of course, intense suspicion and bloodshed and treason and everything else. And so by the time you get to the end of the reign of, of Henry VIII, John Dudley, the Dudley family, is, is, is one of the <coughs> most important families in the court. And I, I love the part when um, John is taking that message of mm. Catherine Howard's infidelity, because mm. that's a really dodgy moment. Because if you're taking news like that to Henry VIII, Ooh. 
oh, you don't know which way it's going to go, do you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it could go one of two ways. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's I I remember coming across um, that that letter, which we we still have, um, and. I, I remember having a look at it, and it says in it, um, by this bearer, John Dudley. And I went, sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, he was the one carrying it. And um, he may have actually, it's, it's a confession that um, Thomas Cramner, Archbishop of Canterbury, sort of gets from uh, a Catherine Howard who is essentially slowly going a little bit mad, um, as you would. Um, and. Um, She's, you know, one minute praising the king, one minute, you know, in absolute tears about her fate, um, another minute in a panic, and another minute coldly almost describing um, the acts that have, have put her in the position that she's in. Um, and, and John Dudley takes this letter to the king. It's unclear he may have been in the room. I didn't put him in the room for this book because I wasn't quite sure, but um, other historians have suggested he was in the room during this, this interview between Cramner and Catherine Howard, um, and I think if anyone makes a, a film out of this, put him in the room because it, it's just—it's <laughs> such a fascinating moment. And yeah, I, you can you can imagine he would be quite terrified um, that you know Henry would kill the messenger, mm -hmm. as as it were. Um, and actually, instead, what he ends up doing um, is being assigned to take um, the Lady Mary out of the court, um, which is one of the first instances we have of the relationship between John Dudley and Lady Mary, Lady, or, um, Mary the First. Um, and it's quite a close relationship, which of course ends quite badly. Um, but it's just, it's so fascinating, all of these early interactions that then provide this really deep context for the events that we know. Oh, well, that was quite brave, wasn't that of him? <laughs> <laughs> it well, was a gamble. You've got to take these chances in the Tudor court. It was a and, gamble. and John does take the chances, um, which I think is, is both why he rises and perhaps why he falls. So tell us a little bit about Jane then. You said she yeah. was your favourite. I, yeah, she is my favourite. We shouldn't have favourites. Any, <laughs> any budding historians out there? No, should. I mean, come on, Tracy Borman and Elizabeth is my favourite yeah. ever. Yeah. <laughs> On this should, very stage. <laughs> yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have favourites, but we all do. Yeah, um, yeah Jane Guilford Dudley is fascinating. We don't know enough about her. I, I, I really tried. Um, this is the problem, of course, with women in the 16th century. Unless they have a crown on their head, it is very, very difficult to find a lot of details about them. Um, but she's, she's raised um, in, in the Guilford family alongside John, um, seems to have had a, a fairly good education, um, you know, writes very well in her letters, um, and is really good at court politics, really, really good at court politics. She knows how to make connections. Like I said, um, she's very well connected with Anne Boleyn, with Jane Seymour, with Anna Cleves, and then with Catherine Parr. She's one of the few people in the very private wedding ceremony between Catherine Parr and Henry VIII. Um, she is there front and center. Um, and then when um, Henry falls, um, she, uh, sorry, when Henry falls, when John falls, when her husband falls, after the death of Henry VIII, um, she is the one who rescues the family. Um, and she is there from, from day one. She's riding off to see Queen Mary to beg for her husband and her children's lives. Um, she's writing letters to women in the new um, privy chamber, um, sick as she is. And, and she writes that she is sick um, waking up in the middle of the night and, and being ill, um, probably because her husband and all of her children are imprisoned and, and likely to, to die. Um, even despite all this, she is, she is fighting, she is working, she is working those connections. Um, when Philip II comes in as king consort, she's making connections with the Spaniards. And, and her last will and testament, just before she dies, is using those connections to save her children's lives. Um, and their, their um, reprieve, their, their um, pardon, is, is dated to the date of her death as an acknowledgement that she's the one who saves her children's lives. And she's just phenomenal. I think she's fantastic. Um, her father's symbol was um, the firebrand, and, and I think she carries that. Um, she, she is a firebrand, and she's amazing. I love her. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I have that for Eleanor of, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Yeah. Definitely, <laughs> definitely a All, favourite. Yeah, also Eleanor of Aquitaine <laughs> is also very true. So if we come on to Lady Jane Grey, yeah. um, because I am so aware there are so many of these Dudleys to get through and so little time. Yeah, sorry. And I, um, but I, my son came home with a history assignment because obviously, you know, our kids learn about the Tudors every five seconds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it had the list of kings and queens and I immediately went, oh, where's Lady Jane Grey? And he said, oh, she's not there. So we had a bit of a conversation about that. Yeah. But what? I mean, nine days is still nine days. Why do you think she was missed out? Yeah, <laughs> I, I have this all of the time. I have, I have two things about Lady Jane Grey. Is one, she's Lady Jane Dudley. Um, and, and the other is, is that she gets missed out um, and her husband, Guilford Dudley, um, one of the sons of John and Jane Dudley, always gets missed out. There was a, um, a volume, a collection that was being put together about um, consorts. In, in England and, and, and Britain sort of through history and they were signing people to, to, to write for that. And I said, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll write the one on Guilford Dudley. And they went, oh, we're not doing one on Guilford Dudley. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's difficult. I mean, I, I think it's, she, she, she could be counted because she is declared by the Privy Council to be queen. Um, she never calls a parliament um, because there isn't enough time. So, so maybe that, um, she doesn't have a coronation, but I mean, that's pretty symbolic anyway. Um, certainly Edward VI had been declared king before his coronation. It, 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 it was sort of a stamp of approval, not the actual act that made him king. Um, so yeah, I, 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 think, I think, you know, we, could, we can call her Queen of England and, and we can call Guilford King Consort of England or Prince Consort of England, depending on how that conversation went. Um, and I think that they should be included as, as Dudley, Dudley kings and queens of England. <laughs> There's a campaign there, isn't there? Is, is there and I will wage it. <laughs> but was she, I mean, how much was she, the, the, popular, the popular belief really is she was very much manipulated. Uh. And we don't hear really about her, we hear about all of the machinations yeah. around her. So do you think we've been doing her an injustice all this time? Yes, I do. So this is, this is, this is another one of my rants um, <laughs> my campaign let it out let it out is um i think our characterization of uh jane gray dudley um does do her an injustice i like to think of a, a jane with a lot more agency and i, I don't put this in the book because i've got no historical record to back this up but i think she could have been a political mastermind because she does very, very well up to a point. And then as soon as she's in the tower, she writes this fantastic account. We think it's hers, um, but let's say it's either her or one of her supporters. Writes this fantastic account of how none of it is her fault. Um, and she was entirely manipulated. As soon as they told her she was going to be Queen of England, she, she, she weeps. And, and, you know, and she hates her in-laws. And, and they force her to do all of this. And, Maybe that's what happened. Maybe that's what happened. Or maybe she was a little bit more involved. <laughs> um, and maybe she knew exactly what she was doing. And maybe she didn't mind. Um, I don't know. I think this victimhood associated with, with Jane Grey might be correct. But the only historical record we have to back that up is written by her in the tower when she's facing execution. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we could go either way with it. And I would love, I would love a presentation of Jane Grey Dudley that, that gives her a little bit more chutzpah. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more of her own fire um, and a little bit less of, of, of her just being a pawn mm. to, to other people's plans. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, you come across this in other trials. I've come across this in witchcraft trials where people are making those depositions, which are, yeah. it wasn't me, I was yeah. forced into it, yeah. which obviously you would do you if, would. You, if your life was at stake. Yeah. So it's hardly surprising. <laughs> I mean, Edmund Dudley does it, right? Um, he says, um, you know, it, it, was, it wasn't me, it was the king. And maybe that was true. And Jane Dudley says, Jane, Lady Jane Grey Dudley, says it wasn't me, it was, it was the evil Dudleys. And I think we've been happy to accept that because we like to present the Dudleys as the Badleys and, and Jane Grey is this, I think it's very Victorian, right? This, 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 this young, poor, you know, hard done by 
it's you know victim mm -hmm. um and i she was a victim in all sorts of ways and you know I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't feel sad for this young person um but uh she may have had her own thoughts at least about what was going on so it's been really tempting um and i've resisted the temptation to go straight for robert because mm. let's face it we're all just a little bit in love with robert dudley aren't yeah. we is there a picture <laughs> <laughs> But take us sort of back a step. How is mm. Robert related to, through that Dudley family? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what are the implications? Because one of the things that really struck me was this potential or relationship with him and Mary Queen of Scots, mm. because that's not something that I think is really, people have really looked at. So, so let's, let's get into Robert. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's, let's talk about Robert. Um, so Robert is uh, a younger son of, of John and Jane Dudley, um, and a slightly elder brother of Guilford, um, who marries uh, Jane Grey, and therefore the grandson of, of Edmund Dudley. Um, when he's born, he's the gosh, fourth, fourth son, fourth, fifth. Um, there's a lot of Dudley sons. Um, so he's a much younger son, therefore would have been very unimportant, um, but a series of, of his elder brothers die, um, and Ambrose is his elder brother is just a bit, just a bit boring, um, and so so Robert really by the time Elizabeth comes to the throne, is the one um, who's really carrying the family into the court. I'm going to regret saying that thing about Ambrose because people are going to tweet at me. Um, <laughs> I, I'll say some fun things about Ambrose in a second. He's okay. Uh, he's a Puritan though, so you know, um, <laughs> a bit boring. Um, and oh now now I'm going to get stuff for Puritan. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, by the time Elizabeth comes to the throne, Robert is really carrying the family, at least in terms of its courtly reputation. Um, and of course, a huge part of that is um, this relationship with Elizabeth. And um, we don't know how far that relationship went. People ask me quite a bit. Did they, didn't they? Because you were there, right? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I unfortunately did not uncover the document which confirms whether or not they did or did not. Um, but uh, certainly they, they were emotionally involved and um, the court was sure that um, they probably were and um, probably would marry. Um, and of course, as you say, then um, jumping ahead a little bit, and we'll probably say something about 1560 and Amy Robesart in a second, but jumping ahead a little bit, um, by uh, the mid-1560s, um, certainly by, by 1564 when he becomes Earl of Leicester, there is this question actually that instead of marrying the Queen of England, he might marry the Queen of Scots. Um, and he's being put forward as Elizabeth's candidate uh, to um, marry, marry Queen of Scots. Um, and it is a really interesting moment um, because, and it's been characterized all sorts of different ways mm -hmm. that um, Elizabeth is sending a spy into Scotland because she knows he's, he's secretly hers, um, that, that uh, Mary Queen of Scots is getting her cast off, <laughs> which I think <laughs> is, 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 is also um, a fun way of, of looking at it. Um, but one of the things I found actually very recently um, after finishing this book is how much, and here he comes back up again in a more interesting way, how much Ambrose is involved in this as well. Um, because as Robert is being presented as a candidate, and some, we know this sometimes, it's, it's in the latest Mary Queen of Scots film, for instance, what people don't cover is that Ambrose is also being suggested, his elder brother is also being suggested as um, a husband for Mary Queen of Scots. Um, and both queens are aware of this, and there's this sort of joking between the two of them that they'll each marry a Dudley brother, but which one? Um, and Mary Queen of Scots is very keen that she not get stuck with Ambrose. <laughs> um, and um, so there's, there's all this talk in the court that one of them will have one and the other will have the other. Um, and um, there's this great conversation between Mary Queen of Scots and her, um, the English ambassador, um, where she says, well, you know, I would take Ambrose if he was as good looking as Robert, um, but he isn't. And I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but she essentially says he's a bit boring. Um, I'd like the other one, please. Um, but, Mary, but, but Elizabeth won't give him up. And so, you know, but there is this moment where it seems like um, a, a Dudley will, will marry um, both the Queen of England and the Queen of Scots um, and have, you'll have two, two more Dudley king consorts, um, in a sense, sort of uniting 
um, England and Scotland. It's, it's, it's a fascinating moment. This is your opportunity to say a good thing about Ambrose, just to stop. I, sure, okay, yes. Yeah, so, so poor Ambrose. So I, Ambrose isn't in the book much, um, but after that... <laughs> just after, one thing, just one thing. Uh, yeah, but after that, I, I, I ended up writing an encyclopedia entry about Ambrose, and um, he's, he's, he's okay. He, he, he's, he's, he's a good military leader. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'm just trying to just trying to save you yeah, from the, the I, Ambrose trolls. I, I know there's some him. Ambrose stands out there who are very <laughs> upset right now. <laughs> I don't know. He's not very nice to his wife. I can't. I'm sorry. You just can't do it. Can I you? can't. <laughs> I don't think he's great. No. <laughs> so a lot of obviously the controversy around Roberts, around the will they, won't they, mm. you know, type situation. Mm -hmm. But obviously then he marries. Uh, so he is already married, uh, so he marries as a young man. Um, he marries um, just sort of on the eve of his 18th um, birthday. Um, he marries um, the daughter of a, of a, a Kentish, um, Kentish, no, Norfolk, sorry, Norfolk um, gentleman uh, named Amy Robesart. And um, they seem to be very much in love. Um, that's at least what William Cecil will say later, is, is that it's a carnal marriage, which, you know, um, and they're young people. Uh, but once Elizabeth comes to the throne, of course, he's spending a lot of time with Elizabeth. There's all this talk that he's going to marry Elizabeth um, and that he will do away with his wife. And then she's found dead at the bottom of a flight of stairs. Um, and, of course, it's a mystery as to what exactly. Um, I don't have the answer for that either. Um, so uh, she, she ends up uh, uh, dead. Um, which actually damages his the likelihood um, that he's going to marry Elizabeth because um, he possibly killed his first wife. So not a great candidate. Um, and uh, for a long time, uh, he, he doesn't marry, perhaps hoping, hoping that he will eventually marry Elizabeth. Um, and again, a fantastic um, letter. I mean, I didn't find it. Others, others have found it um, before me, but I'm coming across it. Um, was, was really striking. It's a letter he sends um, to his, his mistress, um, Lady Sheffield, um, who is essentially begging him to finally marry her. Um, and uh, he says no. Um, he says, um, I, I, there is nothing in this life I would like more than to continue my family um, being now the last of my house. Because Ambrose, being Ambrose, doesn't have any children. <laughs> Useless. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and he's he's not had any children, um, and so you know he says I'd love to be able to carry on the family lines, and there's nothing I'd like more except to retain the favor of the queen. And so it's very very clear that he makes a choice at that point um, to prioritize um, Elizabeth's favor and and staying in good with Elizabeth over carrying on um, the House of Dudley. But then I think something changes, um, and I think it's a combination of um, it being clear that um, he's, he's probably not going to marry the Queen, um, and, and that be becoming more, more apparent to him. Um, and also his, his mistress has a child, uh, has a son. Um, and I think at that point, he, he, he wouldn't have otherwise known that he could have children. Um, and I think that changes something for him, and so he secretly marries, and he secretly marries um, the queen's cousin, um, which is not a great choice. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you're trying to keep the queen's favor, he secretly marries her, um, and when the queen finds out, um, she is livid. He is eventually forgiven. Um, poor Latisse Knowles Dudley is never forgiven. Um, and unfortunately, although they do have a son, um, he dies young. And so he, he, despite all of that, all of that sacrifice and all of that risk to marry, it doesn't actually pay off in, in continuing the family, which is, which is quite tragic. Mm. So it's the sort of gentle, the gentle decline in a sense. Yeah, it's, it's, it's I think it, it's interesting. When I, I came towards the end of, of the book, um, and, and, and it, it's, it's about the House of Dudley, of course, but they are intertwined with the House of, of Tudor. And I, I love the cover um, that my uh, publishers had designed. These, these sort of intertwining flowers, I think, expresses 
a lot about the way in which the House of Dudley and the House of Tudor almost grow together and sometimes compete mm -hmm. um, for, for resources, um, but, but are, are intimately intertwined. Um, and they really both end almost at the same time and, and largely for, for the same reason, which is a lack of heirs. Um, and, and so it, it isn't uh, you know, a dramatic cutting off of the family, um, Robert Dudley, partly I think because he learned from his mother, manages to die in his bed, um, not on the scaffold. Um, and of course, the House of Tudor also has a sort of peaceful end and, and transition into the House of Stuart. Um, but they, they, both, they both close, really, um, with a sense of, of lack of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, we still talk about them both. And so they've obviously, um, they've, they've survived in another mm -hmm. way. And I think one of one of the interesting things about this time is the the, the absolute almost proliferation of queens. Like yeah. This is a time at which there are so many queens, so many women with power, whether it's a power behind the throne of Mary of Guise or mm. whether it's it's queens in their own regnant right. Mm. So this then means that what we what we're able to see is how men traverse the political sort of field in a yeah. sense and how they deal with women and so what what really stands out for you in terms of in terms of that sort of political dance yeah there's there's a couple of really interesting things there um one of the things that really strikes me and this is less about how how well it's sort of how men deal with it but um that uh women other women in the court become incredibly important and central so for instance um when mary the first comes to the throne and Jane Dudley, Duchess of Northumberland, is trying to save her husband and her family. Um, she writes letters to women who she knows who can then make appeals to women who are very close to the queen. Um, and so men sort of don't enter into it at all. It's, it's, it's a network of women talking to women to uh, appeal to a woman. And so those, those connections become incredibly crucial. And we can see that under Elizabeth too, um, that Mary Sidney, um, takes on a very central role. Um, and, and again, I was able to find these ambassadors' reports um, where they're talking about obviously trying to get you know, their sort of their suitor in to marry the queen. Um, and they're sitting down and having meetings with Mary Sidney. She's, she's the crucial player in all of this because she knows, because she's in the bedchamber, because she's a private contact with the queen. Again, this proximity um, in, in a personal monarchy is so important. Um, and Mary Sidney has that. Robert Dudley doesn't, or he might, but <laughs> <laughs> not officially. <laughs> um, uh, and, and so these women become very important, and, and so men have to work through women to a certain extent. Um, his sister Mary becomes his ally in, in this dance of rumor that he has swirling around the queen at this point. Um, and, and I think another thing that, that becomes very important um, to, to men in, in a, a female-dominated court um, is the, um, the sort of the poetry and, and, and the dance and, and the performance of courtly love, of course, um, which makes it very difficult as a historian to work out who actually was yeah. in love, <laughs> right? Um, and who was a favorite um, in that sort of... Um, uh, you know, they thought she thought he was pretty kind of way and who was a favorite in that she really was attached to this person kind of way. Um, and, and, and that sort of um, emotional language um, becomes, as a historian, very difficult to sort of um, interpret, um, but was so, so important to them, I think, at the time. And of course, you know, you have to think about the wives, you know, mm. while their husbands are off writing wonderful poetry, declaring undying love to the queen. I mean, I wouldn't be too happy. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes, again, poor, poor Amy, poor, poor Amy Robsart. Um, I mean, I'd love to, you know, also give a take when, you know, she's got uh, her own agency and mm. maybe she's a political mastermind, but I think it, I think it is actually just poor Amy. Um, she she is, you know, in the country, obviously aware of these rumors. Um, has to sort of put up with them and then of course meets a very, however it happens, meets a very unfortunate end. Um, 
so uh, yeah, Robert not nice to his wife either. <laughs> they're, they're not great people, but please read the book. <laughs> I will second that. It is yeah. absolutely <laughs> excellent, excellent read. So it's, it is interesting to see that how that ex, how that power is exercised by women yeah. on the throne, and how you know how the families have to interact with that and interact with each other. So mm -hmm. those alliances have to shift almost with each queen and each at each stage, don't they? Yeah, it's. I was I was trying to avoid um, in writing this book too much structure based on. Um, the monarchy mm. and and you know um starting and ending parts and chapters um at the death of, of of every monarch that's what happened anyway because it, it is such a fundamental shift um and uh, the sort of um crux or climax moments of the book always came at at the change of of regime um and either the dudleys hold on for dear life and do their best out of the scramble or that's the moment um, where they end up on, on the block. Um, because, as you say, that, that change is, is so, it shakes up so fundamentally um, the order of power. Because, again, this personal monarchy, this proximity, mm -hmm. who has um, not just the ear of, of the monarch, but various other body parts as well, um, becomes, becomes incredibly, incredibly important um, to the way in which power becomes distributed. Um, under under that regime, um, so 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 yes. And when when you have the shift um, from uh, adult male monarch to a child, for instance, as you do with um, Edward the Sixth, um, those those people who most influence him, um, his his uncle uh, Edward Seymour, um, and then his very dear friend John Dudley, are the ones who who have the most power. Um, and when you shift from um, a male monarch to a female monarch, all of the attention and concern falls in, in two places. One, on those women who are closest to her, um, the, the, her ladies, um, and who she's going to marry. Um, and, and those are the centers of power, really. And people do everything they can to congregate around them. And one of the things I remembered was, um, it was quite fascinating for me, that I think it was Scotland, there hadn't been an adult monarch for mm. something like 370 years or something like that. But something like that. Six months was a, was a bit of a record. It was six days. <laughs> six days. Six That's days, it, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and I think this is one of the things too that, um, you know, with those massive shifts of, of, um, of power distribution that happen with the change, is also, in a way, the, um, the, the fragility, I suppose, of, of what that's all balanced on. Um, you know, a 60-year-old child. Again, a fantastic moment where Dudley is in the right place at the right time. Um, John Dudley is in Alnwick and is, is really the connection with Scotland at the moment that James V dies um, and um, Mary, Queen of Scots, becomes queen at six days old. He's the one that finds that out, that sends his spies into Scotland to find out exactly what's going on. And he can't figure it out at first. It's, it's unclear. They, they think there's a child. Um, maybe it's a boy, not sure. Maybe it's a girl. Maybe it's very, very sick and isn't going to live anyway. Um, at one point, he calls her Elizabeth. Um, right? He can't figure out exactly what's going on. Um, but he is the one who finds out, who um, tells Henry VIII, exactly what's happening, um, and is, is able to relay to the English court um, that the King of Scotland has died and that the new monarch of Scotland is a six-day-old baby girl. Um, but so much rides on, on, on the monarch's preferences, um, their, their whims, especially when they're children, um, reading some of the things that Edward VI has to say it's often very chilling. Um, I have a view of, of Edward the Sixth. I'm going to get in trouble for this too. Where he's a bit Joffrey. Um, where he's, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, where he's, he's a little, yeah. Um, uh, but you know, his his, you know, whatever is going on in in this young boy's mind, um, not only determines who lives and who dies, but the whole direction of of the realm. Um, it's. 
it's, it's, it's fascinating how it all teeters on so very little. I think anyone who has children would absolutely shudder at the <laughs> thought of them holding any type of power. I know I certainly yeah. would. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. We're going to, um, proving actually that you don't have to be totally objective to be a historian. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> It's far more fun when you're not, when you have an opinion oh, on the people no. that you spend years and years studying. so much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to turn now to questions. Are there questions in the audience? Because there are lots coming in online. But anyone from the audience first? We have a roving mic. Yes, we have a lady down here. And don't forget, if you do have questions online, please do send them through. Mm. Um, I suppose it's just about uh, Lady Jane Grey Dudley. Thank um, you. <laughs> <laughs> it's working. <laughs> uh, I, was, I guess in terms of like your kind of battle to try and get her recognised as a queen, I suppose, would part of the problem be that her being recognised was sort of inconvenient to the Tudor kind of that unbroken line and then yeah. that kind of monarchical like as you know that like the strength of the monarchy relies on it being stable and like can smoothly transition and that's sort of a blip <laughs> yeah I, th I think that's that's a huge part of it i mean in a way of course she is a tutor that's why she's able um to to make a claim um she um is is uh, a, a granddaughter of um, Mary Tudor and Charles Brandon, and so so has that Tudor blood. Um, but yeah, it, it is considered um, by Mary the First as a usurpation, um, and therefore I think is disruptive to this idea of a sort of secure, solid Tudor dynasty, which is made up, of course. Um, and I think one of the things that um, it's the first thing I assign my um, students who, are ta who take my uh, course on England in the 16th century is a fantastic article, and I'm going to forget the name of the historian who wrote it. I'm really sorry to this person, um, but it's, it's, called, I think it's called What's in the Name, um, and it's about this idea of the Tudor dynasty, um, because they didn't use the, the term Tudor. Um, they didn't use that name, um, and one of the things that it does to think about it as this concrete, sort of almost unassailable great dynasty um, is it, it's, it's very retrospective. It's, it's very presentist um, because when you really get in there, you realize um, that it is teetering, as I said, on, on almost nothing. <laughs> and there are all sorts of um, attempted rebellions and usurpations. There's an actual usurpation. Um, it's never as secure as it seems to us now. Um, and so I try to avoid the, the name Tudor actually through most of the book um, to sort of reflect that. And I think we do need to disrupt a little bit that idea of, of security and, and constancy throughout the 16th century. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a question from Lynn Marie. The Dudley family seem to have been pivotal at the heart of Tudor government. What characteristics and talents do you think they had which enabled them to be valuable to these monarchs? Oh, what a Ooh. fascinating question. Thank you. Was it Lynn Marie? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Lynn Marie. Um, what a fascinating question. I think one of them is, is just um, the, the good or bad fortune to be at the right place at the right time. You know, someone like uh, Edmund Dudley is, is sort of plucked out. Um, he has got the know-how, but that know-how, I think, would have been purely sort of niche academic. Nothing wrong with niche academic know-how, by the way. <laughs> um, but would have been pretty niche academic had it not been exactly what Henry VII needed at that time. And I, I think he is a very sort of early example of, of a sort of failure, actually, that he, he, he is thrust forward, um, but I think lacks sort of the resources to, to stay. Um, and one of those resources is, is making those connections and making those friendships. He, he does not try to make friends at all. Um, and that's really his downfall. I think John does a better job of doing that. Um, he is likable. Um, he makes very, very good friends. Um, and I think Jane is, is the perfect ally in doing so. Um, 
he's, he's, he's strong, he's, he's fairly charismatic, um, he uh, has, has military ability, and that is very important at the time. Um, and, and that stands him in, in good stead for a while. Um, of course, it is Robert who really succeeds in all of this. And again, I think he learned a lot from his mother. I think um, his sister is a great ally in this. What he does is he not only makes friends, um, but he is a bit more ruthless with his enemies. Um, John Dudley, um, I think I say something in the book about um, him having a, a tendency um, to alienate his friends and forgive his enemies. Um, and that really comes back to sort of bite him. Um, Robert has no problem with throwing people under the bus, the carriage, um, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it might be. Uh, he, he, he's, he's absolutely happy to do that. And he is an absolute, um, the, the, the pamphlet that is sort of deriding him calls him a master of shadows, which I actually think he wouldn't, that part of it, he wouldn't be too angry about. Um, it's so hard to know Robert. It's so hard to know what's going on in the Elizabethan period around him because he's so, so good at being this, this, this master of rumor. Um, and I think that is a lot of, of how he succeeds. And I wonder if he had learned from those generations, I think, from his yeah. family's experience. Absolutely. I, I, think, I think John learns from, from Edmund, um, and I think Robert learns from John. But I think, again, more importantly, they're learning from Elizabeth, Jane, and Mary. More questions from the audience? Don't be shy. Yes, gentlemen over there. Uh, hello, thank you very much for your uh, fascinating account of this uh, family. I especially liked uh, your statement about the realness of the documents and mm. missing that in lockdown, which uh, it's great to be able to go back and see these real things. Mm. And to connect that with the theme that has emerged of picking favorites, even though we know we really shouldn't. Um, who has your favorite handwriting and who's oh. your least favorite? <laughs> oh, that's, what yeah, you've, you've, you've read manuscripts before, my friend. <laughs> yeah. um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a fascinating question. In a way, actually, um, my favorite handwriting is, um, the, the handwriting of those, those people who in the Tudor period would have had very bad handwriting. Because bad handwriting in the Tudor period looks a lot like our handwriting, um, which probably says something. Um, and so um, Edward VI, for instance, his sort of child's handwriting. You can go, um, I, think, I think it's hosted by the British Library, actually. Um, there's a digitized version of his um, device for the succession where he, he hands the, the crown to, to Jane Grey. And you can see his annotations in it. I always assign it to my students because they can read it um, because it's a children's, um, it's in a child's hand, which, which is very easy for us uh, to read. Um, so, so go have a look at, at that. Um, uh, Edward Seymour um, has, has a decent enough hand to read. Um, and again, apparently, um, he, he had notoriously bad handwriting, but we can read it, so, so I quite like that. It can go the other way as well, though. Um, I was really struggling. I, I, I spent a long time trying to read the letters of um, Ambrose, Dudley, Ambrose Dudley's second wife, um, Elizabeth Talboys. Um, she uh, writes these absolutely desperate letters to um, Robert, um, begging him to send Ambrose home because he's essentially abandoned her at this point. Um, uh, and um, I, I had to spend, I had to get some um, help with those letters. Um, they were very, very difficult um, to, to read. And I think that's a combination of um, perhaps her not having the same sort of um, education and secretary hand um, that uh, some of uh, the other people I was reading would have had, and maybe her emotional state. Um, and uh, those letters I found difficult to read, not only because um, you know, the paleography was very difficult and transcription was hard, um, but because they were, they were so emotional and so sad as well. And I think that's something that we always need to recognize, that when we're looking at those historical resources, 
there is an emotional cost mm. and price that we pay because we yeah. know what's happening. We're often, as historians, looking at accounts that have been obtained under torture or other methods, and yeah. it, it is it is an emotional thing to do. It is, it? yeah. And I think you know we were joking about you know being subjective when we ought to be objective. And I actually um, think uh, that it is the case that we as historians have to recognise our own subjectivities yeah. um, and you know, recognizing that actually maybe we are being a bit favoritist to s towards someone. Um, and, you know, I, I, I joke about it now and recognize mm -hmm. it now, but, you know, was aware of that at the time that I was writing and researching and therefore was able to sort of account for it and, and, and mitigate it a, a, a bit. Um, but I think also along with that, sometimes our objectivity isn't so objective. Um, and and so I think recognizing our, our our subjectivity and and our emotional connection and our emotional response is part of the job of a historian. Thank you. And this follows on from the mention of the device for the succession. Great. So Bandit Queen, who I remember from last Hist First, so obviously a regular yeah, regular uh, listener. Um, says how much of the device for, for the succession was pressured by John Dudley and how much was Edward's agency? Ah, uh, Bandit Queen, you gotta ask that question. <laughs> that, one, that one comes usually third after did they or didn't they? <laughs> Who killed Amy Robsart? It's, it's usually third, was, was it John Dudley? Um, so, um, I think that that, I mean, we won't know is, is the quick historian's question, or a quick historian's answer to that. Um, I think that um, we have to recognize um, that uh, Edward was approaching, um, I think he was approaching 16 at that point, he was at 15, um, so knew his own mind. And he was a person, a young man, who did know his own mind. And you can't read his letters, for instance, to his um, half-sister Mary, or his, his journal, um, without recognizing um, that he, he, he formed opinions, <laughs> um, sometimes very zealous ones. And um, it is his writing in, in the device. There's no question there. Um, and it, 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 would have been, um, it would have made sense to him to certainly skip over Mary, who was a Catholic, um, and also to look for a male heir. And that, when you really study the device, that is what becomes very apparent, is he is searching the line of succession for a male heir. Because originally in the device, it is going to Lady Jane's heir's male. And then he changes it because he realizes he can't wait along, he's not gonna last that long. Um, and so he changes it to Lady Jane and her heir's male. Um, but it's heir's male that he is really looking for. Neither Mary nor Elizabeth are married at this point, Jane could already be pregnant. Um, and so I think it's that more than anything else that, that is driving Edward towards Jane. Whether John is also going, hey, my daughter-in-law, <laughs> you know, she's a good one, um, <laughs> is, is, is hard to say. But I, I don't think the device is inconsistent with um, what we could expect Edward to be thinking and looking for at that time. Great. That's my sort of non-answer. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? Yes. Hi, are there any descendants of the Dudley family still around? Like yes, today? yes, and in have fact. Have they been involved in the book and have they reacted to it at all? Yes, actually, great question. Um, uh, I, <laughs> I was arranging my book launch um, last week and um, invited um, the great Dr. Elizabeth Goldring, who has a fantastic book on uh, Robert Dudley as a, an art patron. It's a beautiful book, I, I highly recommend it. Um, and I was emailing um, with her about this, um, and she said, can I bring Philip Sidney? I thought, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and so I, I, the only response I could come up with was, I mean, I think one should come, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, she, she brought um, this, this um, uh, he, he works um, works in an English department, actually, um, Philip Sidney, um, and he is a descendant of, um, I, I believe his father is Viscount Delisle now, still, um, and um, 
they've generously invited me to Pen Penshurst, um, which I will probably go and ask them about their archives. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And then I had an email from a, I think it was Thomas Gray, um, who sent me a, a family tree um, that he is, he is connected um, to the Dudley family. Um, so yeah, through the Sydneys and the Greys, um, you, you, still, you still see some, some Dudleys kicking around. Um, and yeah, so if there are any more out there, feel free to, to get in touch and send me your family trees, because um, I, I do find it really fascinating. I see, the importance yeah, of family I know, trees. I brought it back I can't for you. resist saying that. <laughs> Genealogy is where it's at, everybody. Um, so a question from G Young, who said, you've touched on this partly, but what do you think is the biggest misconception people have about the Dudley family or particular individuals within it? Ooh. How much time do we have? Well, yeah. or the biggest question. one, the biggest one. <laughs> um, I think uh, the biggest one um, is probably um, that they, because certainly they were ambitious. And you know, I don't think ambition uh, was a bad trait in the Tudor period. In fact, I think you know it was a necessary one. But um, that they were sort of ambitious and nothing else. Um, that that they had this this pure ruthlessness um, to them. That they were sort of coldly calculating all of the time. One of the things that I really found in in reading the letters and and all of the documents. Um, was um, this 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 love that they had for each other? Um, there's some fantastic moments when when um, Jane, for instance, is writing a letter to her son John, um, and sort of expressing her love, or um, the way that um, Philip is reminded of of his family um, in a beautiful way, um, or the friendships that they they cultivate these long lasting friendships. Some of them not so long and lasting, but <laughs> <laughs> um, they last a while, at least. Um, and I, I think there is this warmth to them that gets lost um, when they're characterized just as the villains of the piece. Um, and, and I think, you know, I, my, my other book is, is on Thomas More. I don't know why I keep getting drawn to these, <laughs> these people that are either presented as, as, as pure goodies or baddies, but I, I really think we lose something. We lose the humanity of history. If we're, if we're casting people as, as heroes or villains all the time, because most people aren't like that. Mm -hmm. Most people are complicated. And it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard as historians, A, not to just fall into that, because we have, we have favorites um, or you know, people we dismiss. Sorry, <laughs> Ambrose. Um, uh, it's, it's hard not to do that as historians. And I, I think it's, 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 it's also hard to try to grapple with the complexity. It's easier just to go, oh, well, you know, the Duke of Northumberland, he was the worst. Um, but uh, people, people are more complex than that. Um, they are now and they were then. And I think if we don't really take the time to grapple with that, um, we, we are just telling stories. And I think that's really, it's vital because history is being used in so many ways. Yep in so many contested yep. ways and to just sort of put people into categories and say they were this and they were that without looking and recognizing that complexity of people yep. and the situation um, is, is absolutely not doing due justice to history. Yeah. So the more we can use our empathy and we can understand the complexity of people's situations and their personalities, then the better service we are doing to history. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and, and to ourselves because history has such a pivotal role to play. Um, in, in our world, um, we, we, we need it and we need good, nuanced, complicated history, yeah. Any more questions from the audience? No, we have one. Oh, I think there's yes, one. yes, sorry. <laughs> I've, I've been doing my genealogy and I've got a couple of Darnleys in there. Hey! But I, there's I a Dudley wonder, in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder how many Darnleys feature in other family trees because there was quite a few of them at one point yeah so there is a whole other house of Dudley <laughs> essentially <laughs> um, uh, so um, as I said Edmund Dudley is the um, elder son of a younger son of a baron that baron obviously had elder sons um, and they, they they crop up a fair bit in in the book as well um, I, uh, the baron's Dudley 
um, often also referred to as the Sutton Dudleys. Um, Dudley begins, it's, as many of you will know, it's a place, um, and it begins as Baron Dudley and then becomes sort of a, a surname from, from there. Um, I do recommend visiting Dudley Castle if you haven't been. You have to go through a zoo to get there. Um, but <laughs> it's worth it. Um, and so, um, and, and the Barons Dudley tended to have possession of Dudley Castle, except for a brief period when John, my John Dudley, has it. Um, so there are some, some Dudleys that are sort of peripherally related. Um, and throughout the Tudor period, they sort of, they sort of compete, actually, especially for possession of, of Dudley Castle. So uh, it'll be interesting to find out which Dudley line um, your family follows. The Suttons, yeah. So the, the Suttons are related to this house of Dudley as well. Um, but it's, it's through that, that, that um, elder son and then younger son. Yeah. Great. And I think that's a wonderful place to finish with <laughs> family that <trees>. personal, <laughs> personal relationship to the Dudleys. Yeah. So thank you, Joanne. That was oh, absolutely fascinating. We covered so much ground. I'm sure you'll want to join me in thanking Joanne for her wonderful presentation. Yeah.